You're listening to KPFA 94.1 in Berkeley, KPFB 89.3 in Berkeley, and KFCF 88.1 in Fresno. Welcome to the Morning Mix. This is the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. It's 4-20-2012. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. Today's show, we address the continuing crisis in higher education. We first interview Harrison Wills, president of the Associated Students at Santa Monica College, where students recently and successfully resisted an attempt by college trustees to establish a two-tiered fee system. We'll hear from Robert Wilkins, CEO of the East Bay YMCA, on National Healthy Kids Day. At the bottom of the hour, it's Steve Zeltzer with Workweek Radio. We conclude today's program with an interview with Professor Jennifer Egan, who's president of the California Faculty Association chapter at California State University. University East Bay, specifically dealing with the strike vote now being held at the CSU campuses statewide. But first, KPFA News Headlines. I'm Eileen Alfandari with headlines for Friday, April 20th. The Florida Neighborhood Watch volunteer charged with killing 17-year-old Trayvon Martin apologized to Martin's parents moments ago during a bail hearing. I wanted to say I am sorry uh, for the loss of your son. I did not know how old he was. I thought he was a little bit younger than I am, and I did not know if he was armed or not. The assistant state attorney immediately challenged Zimmerman's statement. Sir, you're not really addressing that to the court. You're doing it here to the victim's family. Is that correct? They are here in the court, yes. I understand, but I thought you were going to address your honor, Ms. Judge Lester, not. So that's really addressed to the family and where the media happens to be, correct, Mr. Zimmerman? No, to the mother and the father. Zimmerman's apology came at the end of a two-hour hearing on a request for the judge to let him out on bail while he awaits trial. Zimmerman is charged with second-degree murder for shooting the unarmed teenager dead. He has claimed self-defense under Florida's stand-your-ground law. California regulators have upheld a $16.8 million fine against PG&E for the utility's failure to adequately check for gas leaks in its pipelines as required by state law. PG&E acknowledged it did not check for leaks in pipelines servicing communities in the Eastern Bay Area, Fresno, and Yolo counties. But the utility utility had appealed the fine by the PUC as excessive, saying it self-reported the violations. PG&E sent it a statement yesterday it had increased its safety inspections and will continue self-reporting any violations that jeopardize public safety. Economic justice activists who say they're with the 99% are confronting key corporations at their shareholder meetings this spring. Next Tuesday, organizers are promising thousands of homeowners, taxpayers and others will block entry to the Wells Fargo annual meeting in San Francisco. Other actions are planned for energy, banking, and other corporations around the nation. In Los Angeles yesterday, Walmart was the target of a protest. Ernesto Arce reports. As the world's largest retailer celebrates its 50th anniversary, labor and community groups in Los Angeles say there's a sinister side to Walmart's rise to the top. A national coalition is launching the Making Change at Walmart campaign. Santos Castaneda loads and unloads containers at the NFI warehouse in the Inland Empire. The company is a Walmart contractor. We're tired of working 10, 15 hours a a day without getting uh, health benefits. We don't have vacations. We don't have uh, insurance. We don't have nothing. We just have $8 an hour that we make a day. All those cheap prices they have is because we're breaking our backs inside those damn warehouses, loading them dead containers to come in here. The United Food and Commercial Workers is spearheading the Walmart campaign. It has made attempts to unionize Walmart workers, who it says are paid low wages and refused full-time work to avoid health insurance liability. This week, Walmart announced that CEO Mike Duke had received a total compensation of $18 million last year. After a noisy rally, organizers met at the front of the store with Walmart manager Randy Stater. 
We're very happy to be here in the community to provide jobs for people. Well, you ought not be that people. happy. You ought not be that happy because, in fact, you're not sharing a fair share of the pie. With all these stories that we have, I don't see how you can sit up here and say well, that you're happy. Focus. And you ought to be happy because you're making a profit. But what about the people? We Are they happy? This is why they're standing out here now. We're here they're for not the, happy. the associates that work in this store and for the customers to save money so hopefully they yeah. can live better. In Los Angeles, I'm Ernesto Arce, Pacifica Radio, KPFK. A U.S. Army helicopter has crashed in Afghanistan, killing all four U.S. crew members. The U.S. military confirmed the chopper went down last night as it was responding to a suicide attack at a police checkpoint in Helmand province. A district chief there says the aircraft went down because of bad weather. The U.S. officials said they had not determined the cause of the crash yet. The Taliban claimed responsibility. South Sudan pulled back from the brink of war with its neighbor to the north. The South announced today it had started an unconditional withdrawal from the disputed oil region of Hijlij on their unmarked border. Sudan's defense minister claimed a military victory. Thanks God Almighty and thanks Allah Almighty, our and you armed forces successfully freed Hijlij from the mercenaries of South Sudan. South Sudan's president said his newly independent nation still claims the town of Hijlij as part of South Sudan, but he expected its final status to be determined by international arbitration. Far-right extremist Anders Breivik shocked a courtroom in Norway with grisly descriptions of his massacre on an island youth camp. Survivors of the rampage and their family members sobbed during Breivik's testimony in district court. He provided detailed testimony about his attack, explaining how he shot panicked youth at point-blank range. 69 people, mostly teenagers, at an annual summer camp were killed on the island. Breivik has said he was acting to protect Norway and Europe by targeting left-wing political forces that have opened up the country, he said, to immigration and multiculturalism. Coordinated rallies in several cities yesterday billed as a national day of action to stop mass incarceration. Mass incarceration, Brian Edwards Teagert reports. From Frisco to Pelican Bay, we refuse to live this way. From in San Francisco, a march drew several dozen protesters, most sporting signs, shirts, and newspapers from the Revolutionary Communist Party. Their literature says they're joining an upsurge associated with a Trayvon Martin moment. We're using that moment to highlight local causes, like Kenneth Harding, a 19-year-old black man whom police shot to death after he fled a fare check on public transit. Police said he had fired at them while fleeing, but didn't recover a weapon from the scene of the shooting. Marco Scott is his uncle. This has been happening throughout the United States. This has happened with Oscar Grant. This has happened with Trayvon Martin. This has happened with Kenneth Harden. The list goes on. We have to understand, there has to be a stop of this profiling. This has to be a stop of the police not doing their job. That report by Brian Edwards Teekert. Weather forecast for the San Francisco Bay Area morning clouds, then sunny and warm. Highs from the upper 60s to mid 80s. Fresno in the central San Joaquin Valley, sunny and breezy. Highs 82 to 88 degrees. I'll have more news at 10 on letters and politics. Please join us at 6 for the Pacifica Evening News. I'm Eileen Alfandiri. Welcome back to the Morning Mix. This is the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. Today's show, we're going to address the continuing crisis in higher education. But first, uh, Peter is going to share a recent news story based on our program we did recently on Fukushima. This is by Mike Whitney at the Information Clearinghouse. We'll also be following up, by the way, on more Fukushima developments, and we'll be dealing next week with the legacy of the disaster of British Patrol in the Gulf of Mexico. Peter? Uh, Mike Whitney says that the danger to life and the environment posed by the Fukushima disaster is the greatest single security threat to the United States since World War II. Obama administration has provided little aid in the emergency, and Japan is largely going it alone. 
Dr. Hirokia Ki Cody, research assistant of the research reactor at the Institute of Kyoto University, uh, basically stated on, on the radio last month that 1,500 rods are pleasantly located in a fuel pool that's been severely damaged. These rods are cooled constantly by a huge uh, amount of water, and uh, if they were exposed, would release massive amounts of radiation into the atmosphere. It would cause a, set, a shutdown of all six reactors that would affect the common spent fuel pool that and contains 6,375 fuel rods. This would release radioactivity into the air, uh, uh, creating a global catastrophe like we've never experienced before. So this certainly isn't over. And then what they're saying there is that if there was another earthquake, a seven-point magnitude, there's a 70% chance the entire full fuel pool structure would collapse, and there's no containment. This would release 134 million curies of cesium-137, roughly 85 times the amount that was released in Chernobyl. Some experts believe from the U.S. National Council on Radiation Protection that the amounts are sufficient to, quote, destroy the world environment and our civilization. That's an incredibly riveting story. Uh, we'll certainly be following that in the coming days and weeks. Uh, again, to be sure, we've covered it uh, several programs here, and again, we'll we'll come back to Fukushima. We haven't forgotten about that, nor BP, which we'll be dealing with again next week. Turning our attention to today's focus, we're looking at the continuing crisis in higher education. So this is another issue that we've talked about here at Project, the Project Censored show for um well for the, for the last year, and we've hit it pretty hard because it's an ongoing going issue and there are many developments taking place so we're going to look first uh, at a recent the recent event that took place at Santa Monica College the uh, we're going to speak here first with Harrison Wills who's president of the Associated Students at Santa Monica College many of you may recall in the past month that there was a protest involving uh, trustee decisions uh, that were creating a two-tiered fee structure, uh, and among other issues that have been taking place within the community college system, as well as the education system statewide, there have been a number of incidents on campuses where students and community members are protesting so-called austerity measures. So we welcome Harrison Wills with us today from Santa Monica College. He joins us by phone from New York. Harrison, are you with us? Good morning. Thank you for having me. Harrison Wills, tell us a little bit again about what exactly went on at San Monica College, what were the protests about, and uh, the results of those. Well, firstly, as the student body president, I sit in various shared governance um, committees, for example, the District Planning and Advisory Committee. And during our winter break, there was a study session and without input of the Associated Students, the Student Union, and we came back to campus for the spring semester and there had been a unilateral decision and, and it did not go through that shared governance channel, which they so promoted as, oh, we love democracy here in our campus. So when we went to the Board of Trustee meeting for the first time, they were already voting on this and no one even had read the bill. So it was a very new policy. It was a unilateral decision, and the police were protecting the decision makers from the people. And so we sort of questioned that and said, you know, who are you here protecting? We're at a community college. And, you know, I've been in student government for the past two years. I was involved last year as well. And a similar measure came forth at the state level. It was called AB 515, which coincidentally came from district, from our district and assembly member Julia Brownlee. So now this same bill, even though AB 515 did not pass through the legislator, something similar came up, pretty much the exact bill from our district again. So this caught us blindsided. They, they, we came in and tried to stop this. And I'd be happy to share the story and give you some details because it's in. Well, Harris, uh, just background here. This is Peter Phillips. Um, Santa Monica College, like many of the, of the community colleges around the state, had had, had massive cutbacks uh, in available classes. I understand over a thousand classes were canceled on your campus. This made it extremely difficult for students to get the courses they need to to, to graduate. So tell us from there. Um, 
what what the trustees were proposing to do with fee increases and that, and uh, how the students reacted. Yeah, well, the trustees, you know, this is a very typical, you know, we our hand, you know, our hands are tied. They kept blaming the system, even though California has 88 billionaires and we're the only state that doesn't tax our oil companies for an extraction or severance. Um, you know, there's so many solutions, and they kept saying, "Well, we, you know, our hands are tied. There's no money. We don't know what to do." And so they were saying, basically, we're going to create a pay-to-play model. There'd be no state subsidies, no state financial aid. And those that can afford these classes will get them. And what they were saying was, their rhetoric was, well, we're opening additional courses. Every course isn't going to cost more. But then what I said is, well, if you're, because their argument was, well, we're going to be opening additional courses with the money we make. And I said, well, firstly, who's going to get those classes? And are we a for-profit college? The last time I checked, I thought we were a state-funded community college. So if you look at the numbers of the people we serve over the last few years, the non-resident, the international students has gone up. Meanwhile, working-class Californians are getting squeezed out, and they're blaming, they're telling me, you know, Harrison, what do you want us to do? And I tell them, I say, look, we just took a bus full of students to Sacramento. We continue to advocate and lobby. And at this point, Every campus in the entire state of California should be being leaders right now. But the, the trustees could go beyond their role as bureaucrats and politicians and host town hall meetings called public sector, public education crisis and solutions. And you get every teacher and every administrator and every student to participate. And you work with K-12 through and you work with the UCs and you work with the CSUs and the California Community Colleges. And if you don't think that millions of Californians can't come together, then I think we really have the lowest expectations in the history of the state. And what I keep saying is we need to remain, to remind ourselves that many of these people who are making these decisions, specifically the Board of Trustees themselves, went to the UCs when they were free. And I refuse to forget that. And I refuse to believe that there's no money. I don't buy that rhetoric. And I know that the for-profit corporate media, which continues to say that, has their own agenda as well. For example, the Washington Post receives 62% of its funding from its subsidiary, Kaplan University, which is a for-profit school. So what, what happens here is you have students protesting, demanding that they have a participation in the democracy and the decisions that affect their lives. And that's what we're taught in school. We're taught all day long. You know, your generation doesn't care, Harrison. You guys need to care. I mean, get out there and do something. But, but not here and not now and not like this. I mean, there's very, a lot of contradictions. So Harrison Wills, again, it sounds like you have your head wrapped around the situation pretty clearly. Uh, Danny Weil has written several pieces and new pieces even coming out on our website, projectcensored.org and blog, The Daily Censored, about Kaplan, about these conflict of interest issues. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, and what you're doing, uh, Harrison, uh, you really are defying <laughs> what, what, what people that sit on this board of trustees really, really act, what their actions show. Again, you pointed out the rhetoric may be one thing, but then when you do show up and you you do demand what's as as you said in in a quote uh quote i'm tired of asking for permission for what's rightfully ours and you're talking about a right to an education and that's right. that's a core issue and of course um the, the 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 police then of course as as people may remember uh pepper sprayed uh, students in the in the crowd and and in fact uh, a young girl as young as 4 years old from yeah. what we understand, yeah. and this yeah. follows on the heels of what happened on the UC Davis campus. And, of course, we know that the the Regent Report just came out about that, that uh, slammed the administration and the police at UC uh, for the use of pepper spray. Can you talk to us in a little more detail about that incident at Absolutely. Santa Monica College? Absolutely. Okay. The this is a clear example of the type of legislation that's being, I mean, on a larger scale, NDAA and HR 347, anti-protest bills. I mean, all over the country right now, you're seeing a crackdown on our constitutional rights to peacefully assemble. 
And it's unbelievable. I mean, it, it's happening on our campus, and I never thought that I would see this on our own campus in so-called progressive you know, Santa Monica College. But really, you know, we need to hold people, and I've been saying this, you know, you have to take a position and and you need to take responsibility for the decision you make, and you need to know the implications of these decisions, okay? We need to stop blaming other people and saying it's like, you know, voting voting for the war but being for peace, voting for Yucca Mountain but being for the environment, voting for open trade with China but being for, you know, equity and, and, and the global economy. All of these things are happening. So you have – here you have students showing up to protest, okay? We – previously went to a board of trustee meeting a month before and the cops were there then okay and told us to go to the overflow room which is a form of self-censorship it's removing you from the actual dialogue and space where you can actually experience the you're in an entirely separate room you're kettled into another room and so that happened before so i went up and spoke on that then and i have this this is all documented this is during the minute this is on youtube all of this and i said I said, this is not democratic, okay? We're in a room. There's five students in here, you know, and we're all in the other room. And this room is filled with managers and administrators and trustees. And who do you serve? I said, you've got to find a bigger room for this. This is not acceptable for a school of this size of 35,000 students. And these meetings are held 6 and 7 o'clock on Tuesday, okay? So there's a lot of available space. So we, they had known that because, in fact, the prior meeting had been shut down because students were so enraged because they were so far removed from the decision makers. And the decision makers are out of touch. Just to give you an example of this, they're not even on our campus. They're seven blocks away on 26th Street, and we're on 17th. I mean, they're, they're like a do- half a dozen blocks away or more from us, from the campus. They're out of touch with what's really going on in the struggle that students deal with. Harrison, what I hear you saying is that uh, the trustees were proposing to create literally privatized classes, charge $200 right. a unit, um, right. and, and, uh, so like if you wanted an English 1A class and they were all completely full, you could have the option if you had the money to go ahead and buy a class, um, and, and have it count towards, you, towards your degree. Oh. And now you've had a, a victory here in that the Attorney General's office has, is now saying that that's illegal. Tell us about that. Well, you know, it's just really funny because a lot of students and a lot of teachers, I mean, I want, I want to talk about institutional power. Because, you know, who has the ability to build a consensus here? I mean, our administration can send an email to 35,000 people in a matter of seconds, okay? So institutional power must be recognized. And the disenfranchisement of students must be recognized. And I think we need to be essentially brutally honest about what we're dealing with here. And so there had been a consensus building campaign to promote this. And so any time we had misquoted them, Okay, and said, look, they're $200 a unit. They came out and said, Harrison, it's $180 a unit. And I said, I don't care if it's $160 a unit. This is a four or 500% increase. I mean, this is just wrong. This is, and then, so they try to get me on semantics and language and they said, Harrison, it's not every course. It's some courses. I'm like, still, it's still not right. Okay, well, Harrison so, Wills, what you're also describing is a pattern of, of rather despotic behavior, of anti-democratic behavior um, yes, by these yes. administrators that are purportedly role models. And just to, just quickly, we we're, we're, we only have a, a minute left in this segment. Um, numerous people have weighed in. I mean, of course, the Regents report on the UC Davis is out slamming the officials there. Uh, and as far as Santa Monica went, Julia Brownlee has weighed in on it, the Assemblywoman. Um, we've also seen... Uh, Paul Wertheimer, who runs an international crowd safety consulting group, also coming out and saying what's happening at Santa Monica was um, absolutely egregious. A a psychologist from Beverly Hills came out and said that this behavior is completely off the charts. I mean, this is police state violence and behavior we're looking at. Yeah, and and I want to tell you, a whistleblower from the staff, a whistleblower from Santa Monica College contacted me at 9 p.m., okay, uh, about a week ago, and told me that the police were, con- some of the, the lower-level police were concerned themselves. They said, look, these students, they, go, we need, they said, we need a bigger room because it's going to get out of hand. And the administration said no. 
You hold it in that meeting, in that same small room, and you get there early. Uh, Harrison, it sounds like a setup. It sounds like you're really engaged there. The students are saying no to this. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not kidding and, you, and, uh, I'm going, and I'm telling the whole world. I'm going out in public and saying this is what's happening. Well, we're going to okay? stay. I'm, we're going to stay with you, but we're out of time right now, and uh, we'll be back in touch with you. And uh, let's find out more how this whole story evolves. Thank you very much. Let me know when I can come back on because there's a lot of things happening. I'd be happy to share. The world needs to understand what's really happening on our on our community colleges and public education all over the country. Harrison, Wills, again, thanks for joining us. We'll certainly have you back on. We'll be in touch. Our next guest is Robert Wilkins, and we turn our attention briefly to Healthy Kids Day. Robert Wilkins is CEO of East Bay YMCA. This is Healthy Kids Day nationally. Um, and it, we're, this is, uh, there's free community events that are happening here to help families find fun through active play and educational opportunities. Uh, of course, uh, it, it, we just got done talking with Harrison Wills about the rights of education, uh, and, and youth issues. Here we are talking with Robert Willi- Wilkins about Healthy Kids Day. Robert, are you with us? I am. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Could you tell us about Healthy Kids Day? Healthy Kids Day actually is next weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, the 28th. And 28th, yes. And uh, it is a series of activities and information. It's sort of like a health fair focused on kids and families at various YMCA locations throughout the East Bay and across the country. The idea is to uh, present a series of activities and, again, information on healthy eating, physical activity, and good relaxation and stress reduction kinds of uh, activities with a particular focus on the fact that summer is coming and there is a lot of vacant time available for kids and families to both be involved in things, but also uh, there are lots of lags in normal activities that take place at school and after school programs. So we're trying to strengthen families and get them ready for a good, active, healthy summer. Uh, Robert, this is Peter Phillips. Uh, we're the Project Censored show here today, and you're the, the CEO of the East Bay YMCA, uh, which is an international organization. Actually, the headquarters are in Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, I, w- I was pleased to read that, that the, some of the, uh, the values that are expressed now, um, the five core values of, 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 of the Ys, are, are caring, honesty, respect, responsibility, and inclusion. Um, so it sounds like that's part of the program, part of being healthy kids, being inclusive in our communities. Uh, can you say more about that? Uh, yes, inclusivity is very um, uh, important because all of us uh, are better when we uh, experience the wide variety of cultural and um well, cultural, uh, educational, spiritual uh, expressions. And so embracing all of the cultures in our community and focusing on the various ways in which health and vitality is expressed through their cultures and through their traditions are very much brought forward and shared through Healthy Kids Day. For example, tomorrow we'll actually launch Healthy Kids Day down in Fremont, which is a very uh, diverse community with a large uh, Afghani population. And so a lot of the activities and so forth that we have tomorrow will center around um, physical activities, dance, movement exercises, food and nutrition practices from that particular culture. And many of the residents in that community will become acquainted, more acquainted with those kinds of things uh, tomorrow. And as a result of that, uh, it brings about just a greater um, awareness on the part of individuals who are participating in it and a greater sense of community and belonging with people who are were not familiar with those kinds of things prior to their encounter with them at Healthy Kids Day tomorrow. 
that'll be duplicated throughout all of our communities. Well, we're talking with Robert Wilkins, CEO of the East Bay YMCA. We're talking about Healthy Kids Day. You know, I couldn't help but um, but think when Peter was talking about the values the Y is putting forth, caring, honesty, respect, responsibility, and inclusion. Based on our last segment, it would seem that uh, educational administrators and trustees and so forth might learn a little bit from the Y. Um, also, this idea of Healthy Kids Day, I, I know I, I misspoke when I may have said it was today, but I, I think maybe what I'm thinking is um, every day should be Healthy Kids Day. Isn't that uh, right, Robert Wilkins? Isn't that also what the WISE programs are trying to promote? Absolutely. Uh, and Healthy Kids Day just gives us the opportunity, A, to accentuate it and bring some attention. And a lot of what Healthy Kids Day uh, is about is empowering parents and kids as families to be able to engage in healthy lifestyles every single day in their own home, in their own neighborhood, in their own community. Of course, we appreciate and welcome their participation in and at our YMCA facilities, but we are advocates not just for membership and come to the Y, but we are advocates for healthy lifestyles, period. So a lot of the activities that they'll engage in are things that they can do when they go home and incorporate as a part of their daily uh, living. So that's a very important part that we appreciate that you um, mentioned. Thanks so much, Robert Wilkins. Again, the why over 100 years coming out of a social justice background and, and still at it with caring honesty, respect, responsibility, and inclusion for Healthy Kids Day. Robert, very quickly, where can people go for more information? They should be able to visit our website at www.ymcaeastbay.org and the various locations in Oakland, Hayward, Fremont, Pleasanton, Richmond, and um, and worldwide. Worldwide, uh, you. <laughs> you'll be able to tap into all of that information there. Thank you so very much for being on the program today. Okay, thank you for having me. Up next, Steve Zeltzer and Workweek Radio. Busting in Union Democracy. On Wednesday of this week, a picket was called by CWA 9415, which represents the paid staff at KPFA, to protest the hiring by Pacifica of a law firm called Jackson Lewis. I have some personal experiences fighting this firm since I was supporting an injured biotech worker, Becky McLean, who was working at Pfizer and was fired after making health and safety complaints about the contamination of her and others at the Pfizer Groton Laboratory, which contains 6,000 scientists. When the federal trial took place, she faced lawyers from the Jackson Lewis firm who tried to defeat her complaint as a whistleblower, protecting her and the public's health and safety. She won the case despite great odds and defeated Pfizer and their hired guns, Jackson Lewis. I obviously have an axe to grind in fighting Jackson Lewis and exposing their role. For this reason, I support the removal of this firm by Pacifica. But as in every other question, there are other issues involved. The management says that the insurance company that covers Pacifica for retainer offered the firm and that the firm was only used in non-labor legal work and not working with the bargaining units. It has not been used at KPFA and union arbitrations. It is also important to point out that this firm was hired in 2009 and some members of the Pacifica board of those supporting the picket line actually voted themselves to support this firm being retained. One very important fact that was also not covered on the KPFA Evening News on the day of the rally was that organizing director of the CWA District Council 9, Libby Sear, publicly called for a financial boycott of KPFA and Pacifica. According to her at the rally, quote, This is one listener who's done being generous. I will not, I cannot fund union busting at my local community radio station, and I hope all of you will seriously consider doing the same, unquote. This public call by a leader of the CWA for the financial boycott of KPFA and Pacifica is a very serious matter. KPFA is already suffering from a loss of income from declining membership and an extremely difficult time for our listeners, many of whom have trouble paying for rent, gas, health care, and the rest of their bills. As an unpaid programmer, member of the unpaid staff organization, and supporter of KPFA and Pacifica, as the only real national voice for working people on the radio, I question whether calling for a financial boycott is a correct tactic at this point. There is another critical issue that needs to be addressed, and that is whether or not this public position by Sister Sarah was actually discussed and voted on by the union members at KPFA. You would think that a very serious issue such as this 
that would obviously affect the real financial situation of the station, including the paid staff, would require a discussion and debate within the union. From what I understand, there was no such discussion and debate, and this is just the individual position of the union official representing KPFA CWA workers. There is another factor which needs to be entered into this debate, and that is the other statements by the CWA representative. In April of last year, Sister Sierra wrote a letter to ILW Local 10 condemning a leading ILW member for going on the Morning Mix show. This ILW member was discussing why the union shut down Bay Area ports on April 4th in solidarity with Wisconsin workers. In her letter, she said this member disgraced the ILWU and, quote, stuck a knife into the back of workers at KPFA radio, unquote. Again, one has to ask, was this attack on ILWU member for going to the KPFA morning mix show approved by the CWA KPFA union members? Or was it just this the individual view of the CWA District 9 representative? At the same KPFA CWA picket, I interviewed Sister Sarah about the continuing union busting against CWA AT&T workers who are working without a contract. Sarah talked about the national union busting drive by AT&T as well as by Verizon to attack CWA members. Verizon workers went on strike that was building tremendous momentum. However, they were sent back to work without a contract and without a vote of the rank and file members. I asked her if they were going to have any actions on May Day for the AT&T workers who were also working without a contract. She responded by saying they did not want to let management know if they would take action on May Day. One question that needs to be asked is why the CWA is picketing KPFA and Pacifica, which has a contract with this union, while there has been no union pickets against the national union buster AT&T. This again raises the question about what Wednesday's picket was really about. This is Steve Zeltzer with Workweek Radio, and now we go to our calendar. This is the Workweek calendar for the week of April 20th, 2012. On Saturday, April 21st, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., there will be a Labor General Assembly called by Occupy Oakland Labor Solidarity Committee to organize and support workers' unions and unorganized workers. They will be discussing labor actions this coming May Day and how workers can support these actions. The assembly will be held at Oscar Grant Plaza at 14th and Broadway, and lunch will be provided. For more information, go to Occupy Oakland Labor Solidarity Committee at oolabor.org. That's spelled the letter O, the letter O, L-A-B-O-R dot org. Picketing continues at the Frank Hotel in San Francisco by workers who are members of Unite Here Local 2. The hotel is illegally fired union activists and is seeking to bust the union. The picketing is held on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at the hotel, which is located at Geary and Mason near Union Square. This small hotel is acting like a big bully. You can get more information on the solidarity picket by visiting hotelfranksf.info. The Santa Cruz-based Rio Work Labor Film Festival is expanding to Berkeley. The festival commemorates May Day by showing working-class films during the commemoration of May Day. On Friday, April 27th, a new film, Brothers on the Line, about the UAW Ruther Brothers will be screened at 7 o'clock p.m. at the Berkeley Fellowship of Unitarian Universalists Hall at 1924 Cedar near Bonita. Sasha Ruther, one of the grandsons of the Ruther brothers and the producer of the film, will be speaking. For more information about the Labor Film Festival, visit realwork.org, that's spelled R-E-E-L-W-O-R-K dot org, or email laborstudies at att dot net. Saturday, April 28th is commemorated as Workers' Memorial Day around to commemorate workers who have been killed on the job and those injured and in fighting for their health and safety and for health care. Millions of workers have been injured nationally on the job, and many have lost their health care benefits, families, and homes. California, under Schwarzenegger, deregulated workers' comp, and this cut permanent disability benefits by 50% and made it very difficult for seriously injured workers to get care. The commemoration will show a film called Before Their Time about cancer in the workplace, and there will be speakers. The event will take place at San Francisco Bernal Library at 200 Cortland Street at 2.30 p.m. For more information, go to workersmemorialday.org. If you have events for the labor calendar, send them to info at workweekradio.org. This is Erica Lucarati with Workweek Radio. Okay, we're back continuing here on the Project Censored Show discussing crisis in education, higher education in the state of California. And uh, the California State Universities have seen a $970 million cut since 2008. And this has created hardships across the state in terms of uh, numbers of classes and faculty and that. And uh, currently, the faculty are voting on every campus whether or not to consider having a strike this fall. With us in studio is Jen Egan. She is a professor of philosophy and president of the California Faculty Association at, at CSU East Bay. 
Uh, she teaches there since 1999 and teaches course in ethics, feminist philosophy, environmental ethics, human rights, and social justice. Jen, thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. So we're having a vote, and I say we because I, I am a faculty member as well, um, statewide through the California Faculty Association um, regarding whether or not we give stri strike authorization to the union. Why, why is this happening? Well, this is happening because uh, the collective bargaining agreement uh, ended in on June 30th, uh, 2010. And since that time, uh, we've been in bargaining. And since that time, the CSU management hasn't really shown any very good faith efforts. Uh, when that contract expired, realizing that the state was in a budget crisis, uh, the California Faculty Association, the faculty union, uh, proposed to extend the contract, extend the contract with no salaries, uh, keeping all the other provisions at status quo uh, until hopefully the, uh, the fiscal crisis ended. And the CSU management refused that. Um, and we think now that they refused that uh, to seize on the opportunity to take power and rights away from faculty. So this, uh, this vote to authorize a strike and the potential strike that might come from that it really isn't about salary. It's about power and it's about uh, competing visions, one of the chancellor's office and one of the faculty and the students. Well, we've seen um, the CSU has actually proposing two-tiered uh, financial systems similar to what Santa Monica ha had proposed, where they're actually going to offer courses through extended ed, hope to make it a profit-making entity for the campuses. Um, and uh, create, that, of course, creates more expense for students. And some campuses, uh, up to up to 10, 11 percent of the students actually, in order to graduate, have to take extended ed courses in the summer, pay extra money for them if they're going to graduate in in a four year or five year plan. Um, that's that's difficult, and it makes it difficult on faculty because we're paid they're paid less to to teach those courses, and there's no counseling or advising that goes along in that kind of time period as well. Uh, plus, we've seen across the country um, threats against tenure, this idea where in Louisiana, the universities there had fired professors, in fact, and then rehired them, tenured professors, and then rehired them uh, to teach as lecturers for a lot less money. So there is a threat to this idea of a university with tenured faculty um, and, uh, you know, curriculum that, that's meaningful for people in a very broad way. You're a teacher of philosophy. And certainly that isn't something that Hewlett Packard is going to be clearly high on their agenda to hire somebody for. So how, how do we deal with this? Well, I think that um, the CFA has been opposed to these proposals. The uh, CSU already has a two-tiered pricing system, uh, as was described with Santa Monica College. And the chancellor's office uh, seems to keep rolling out proposals to extend that two-tiered pricing. And what's really unfair about that is that it sort of picks on some of the most vulnerable students. Uh, there's a proposal on early start where students who need uh, remedial work in English and math would pay more for those classes in the summer before they begin. Uh, there's also proposals out there to make students who who've just been hanging around too long, uh, pay more in order to take their classes to graduate. So that's picking on students that need remediation and students that are finding their way and maybe change their major midstream, and it's just simply unfair. Jen Egan, thanks again for joining us. This is Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips, Project Censored Show. Um, this this ties in with, um, of course, broader themes that we hit on even uh, last week. We had people on from the, uh, the National Priorities Project. So we're talking about you know raising fees, and uh, we heard it with the Santa Monica trustees. Well, asking the student president, well, what should we do, and where do we get the money? I mean, again, these are things they should know. Um, but it's hard to ignore the fact that there seems to be money flying out of the coffers for wars, occupations, bank bailouts, but the students are a are trillion dollars in it. Uh, with, with student debt. So how, how do you see, the, what does the face of that look like where you are and how does that, um, how does that motivate and inform you to, uh, to these potential actions with the faculty and the strike? How are these issues, in other words, then, how do you connect these? 
Right. And I'll be voting yes uh, on the strike authorization vote. And one of the reasons is I feel that we need to defend the CSU as the people's university. Um, this is a university that serves um, poor, poorer uh, students of color, uh, less advantaged students in our state. And the purpose of the CSU is to invest in those students so that the state can thrive and that they individually can thrive. Um, but since, 20, uh, since about 2010, uh, as a department chair, I've seen tons of lecturers let go, and they were really, they had worked there for a long time. They were master teachers. Students adored these folks. It, they were a true loss. And at the same time, we have students. Uh, I just talked to a student the other day uh, who I was advising. Uh, she's taking a really serious overload of courses so that she can graduate and I asked her if she thought that it was wise to take so many units this quarter and she said well I have to hurry up and get out of here before the 9% fee increase this fall. Not only that, you know, I teach uh, Diablo Valley College and we were just talking with, you know, folks at community college level. We're also talking about transferability, transfer students and uh, one of the possibilities for spring 2013 regarding budget certain budget initiatives is that there may be no new students yes the csu may limit uh, or severely curtail or cut off transfer students and then what this does is for students who are in the community colleges it creates a backlog for them the community colleges are impacted so then those students will hang around the community college and take more units and wait until they can get into the csu so the cuts at every level uh, keep disadvantaging students at, at each turn. We know that uh, student debt in the country has risen substantially, and this, of course, is directly related to the fee, the fees and tuition increases at the public universities. Um, California State University used to be free. Uh, I certainly attended back in the 70s, and it was $50 a semester for student fees. Now students are facing several thousand, six thousand dollars a year, uh, on, and then of course room and board on top of that. Which an amazing uh, uh, information came out recently that, say, for a family that makes 50,000 a year, that's a huge amount. They can borrow money against it, and they may get some some support. But if their student actually got into Harvard. Harvard would subsidize their in it would be cheaper to go to a private university because they had such great subsidies and uh, that that seemed amazing t uh, to us regarding uh, the CSU which was originally set, set up to be the people's university have people access from all over the state the top one third of high school graduates were eligible to go and um, and for free so we've really kind of lost that. And in that process, this idea of making these campuses profit-making, of making these campuses uh, huge debt uh, things where, the you know, the central banks are loaning these, you know, the Sonoma State is $300 million um, to build buildings and all this. It, so it's a whole different atmosphere on campus today. Is that, is right. that, would you see it that way? Yes, I think that's right. And at the CSU, it's not sort of the simple narrative of the state budget collapse. Now the CSU has no money, so now we have to charge students more. Uh, that narrative's a little bit too simple. Uh, the CSU does have money in reserves, um, and they do have money to launch all of these initiatives, which cost money. The Early Start Program, uh, the proposal to create Cal State Online, a sort of University of Phoenix-like uh, for-profit arm of the CSU um, and spending millions of dollars on consultants to bargain our contract and to bargain the contract of the other unions on campus. So there is uh, not to mention the executive pay increases that we've been paying campus presidents and other administrators uh, while faculty uh, haven't seen a raise in five years. What, what does a, a president of a university in California, the CSU, make? Uh, well, it's upwards of $300,000, depending on the campus. Uh, and we di uh, if you probably heard in the news about recent campus presidents getting a very large fee increases. And after some public embarrassment, uh, the CSU Board of Trustees passed a policy that uh, presidents coming into office would only get 10 percent more than their predecessor. And in the past two, the past two presidents who were recently hired got exactly that 10 percent. Uh, Jen Egan, and that's why faculty go with salary freezes 
um, when uh, administrators refer to pay restorations as pay raises, uh, I mean, you know, the, all the tricks come out of the bag, uh, the semantic uh, tricks. What is going on with the current possibility of the strike, this strike vote? What what implications do you think this will have um, how do you think this is going to, A, send a message to administrators, and B, what message might it send to students in your estimation? Well, we had a strike on our campus um, November 17th of last year. And one of the things we learned we learned from that is that uh, big shows of power uh, do have implications. They've had implications in our, mediating, in our bargaining and mediating process. Um, and we got very favorable editorial reviews from the major Bay Area newspapers. And when you talk to our students, they understand. I think when you talk to students, they realize, uh, you know, it's, it's us in the classroom together. Uh, they know that our working conditions are their learning conditions and that the, the faculty union has been opposed to all these fee increases that they've been suffering. Right. And it's also illustrative of the fact what I'm hearing you say, too. I mean, the faculty aren't this isn't a frivolous act. This isn't some kind of knee jerk reaction. Uh, this is a long standing struggle. And essentially what you're saying is this is the wall. Yes, and I think a, how a lot of faculty um, think we are defending the CSU, and it's analogous to when the nurses go on strike, right? When nurses go on strike, they talk about if my workload is this high, it hurts patients. It might kill patients, uh, and even though we're talking about figurative life and death rather than literal life and death, uh, when our working conditions change this drastically, it's hurting students, and in turn, it's hurting the state of California, um, and I know... Uh, most faculty I can speak for, I think, uh, we love our jobs, we absolutely love teaching, and we love our students, um, but not at any cost and not under conditions that harm both of us. So it looks like um, the strike will, the CFA faculty will, will vote in terms of supporting a strike. Um, if contract negotiations break down or continue, and what we're looking at then is in the fall, the possibility of beginning strike action. So how, what will that look like? Well, if uh, and there are a series of ifs, uh, if, if at the end of the fact finders report, uh, the CFA uh, board of directors calls a strike, uh, it will be a series of two day rolling strikes through the 23 campuses. Um, and that will be determined by the board of directors. Uh, but we're hoping in that time our goal, our goal in calling the strike vote is to n not strike. Uh, what, we're, what we would like to do is to use this political leverage uh, on the chancellor's office to come back to the table and negotiate in good faith. Five years ago, I think, we were doing kind of in the same situation, and the governor, uh, Schwarzenegger at that time, uh, instructed the chancellor to settle it because they didn't want to see ro roving strikes. Um, and uh, But from that contract, none of it was honored. I mean, there were no, the raises that, the, the 1 or 2% raises that had been scheduled um, were just ignored, and the chancellor was saying there's not enough money. So what's the danger of even if they agree that they, they could just continue to say we don't have the money? Exactly. And one of the provisions uh, that uh, the CFA uh, doesn't want to agree to, the chancellor's office in his proposal uh, wants to be able to reopen the contract in one year. And we assume that reopener means to take back salary and benefits. However, if we agree to that contract... Uh, and the contract is reopened in a year, we would have agreed to the contract, so we would no longer have a right to strike or the right to do any kind of concerted action. So th this is um, it's a pretty tangled web that's been, been woven here. And where, uh, Jen Egan, where can people go, where can people in the community go to learn more information about all of these issues that we're talking about. I mean, granted, you're very involved and very active in this. Uh, Peter is also in, in, involved in this. I'm, I'm involved in the JCs. Uh, but, you know, outside the campuses, um, 
it, it's, it's almost like it's a very specialized kind of struggle, even though it is so broad and even though it impacts so many people. I, I sometimes get the impression when I'm talking to people that are sort of outside the educational sphere that they don't always seem to know the particulars. Where, where would you suggest people go to maybe get more primers, more information about these struggles? Well, there's a lot of information about the CSU and the California Faculty Association on the California Faculty Association website, which is calfac.org. Uh, other places, there are a lot of good um, other uh, venues for information like uh, um, againstthecuts.org um, or the, uh, uh, the Council for the Future of Higher Education has a good website. Um, and it is really a national struggle and it's happening on all levels. We see that some of our friends in the state legislature also have bills pending. One is by Betsy uh, Butler, AB 2427, which would ensure that matriculated CSU students would that had to take required courses offered through extended ed would pay the same fee, so they wouldn't be charged more. Um, another one is uh, AB 2497. Uh, by Assemblymember Jose Solero, which which would require that the mandatory early start program, where people who aren't fully prepared have to pay higher fees in the summer, um, if that if the, they tried to implement that, that they could only operate it if it was authorized by the state legislature and actually have fees. So so there's certainly people who understand these issues that are that are going on uh, in 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 Sacramento. Um, but we're certainly dealing with um, the higher powers of, of the California <clears throat> Business Roundtable and uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the trustees in that um, higher education uh, free for uh, lots of people in the state is no longer a top priority. Yeah, that's right. And uh, the CFA is very happy to see those bills uh uh, come come to the legislature, and we're hoping to be able to put increased political pressure to shine a light on uh, some of the effects of the changes in the CSU that are affecting students. Jen Egan, thanks so much for joining us today, and our listeners can go to the websites uh, that were listed there. She's Professor of Philosophy and President of the California Faculty Association at California State University, East Bay. We'll certainly be touching base with you uh, again on the vote and the outcomes. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, that wraps it up for today. One quest, um, sorry, one correction. The Occupy Oakland Workers Assembly uh, will be at the California Nurses Association. That's 20th and Franklin, not Oscar Grant Plaza. The address is 2000 Franklin. We also have two other brief announcements. Haiti Rising from the Ashes, a documentary film. That's Saturday, tomorrow, April 21st, 2012, 6.30 p.m. supper, 7.30 p.m. film. That's at 9 Ross Valley Drive at the First United Methodist Church in San Rafael. Guest speaker will be filmmaker and morning mixer J.R. Valerie, the Minister of Information. One last announcement. We have the Jamaican American Association of Northern California inviting you to a theater party for opening of its new film, Marley, the documentary Life and Music of Bob Marley. That's tonight, Friday, 20th of April, 420 at the California Cinema Center, 2113 Kittridge in Berkeley, California. Tickets are $8 for the 5 p.m. show, 1050 for the 8 o'clock show. This is KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, 88.1, and online at kpfa.org. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. This is a listing of upcoming events in the Bay Area for the week ending April 29th. All events are wheelchair accessible. Please listen carefully for contact numbers. On Monday, April 23rd and Tuesday, April 24th at 7 p.m., stage readings of Just Like a Dog, inspired by the playwrights witnessing a gas chamber execution, will be performed at the Ashby Stage, 1901 Ashby Avenue in Berkeley. $15 in advance, $18 at the door. For details, call 510-841-6500. On Tuesday, April 24th at 2 p.m., the Santa Rosa Junior College Sustainable Agriculture Club presents Preserving the Future of Our Seed Heritage with Paul Wallace of the Petaluma Seed Bank. This free event will take place at Schoen Farm, 7450 Mark Olson Lane in Forestville. For details, call 805-215-9168. On Saturday, April 28th at 11 a.m., you are invited to learn where meat, eggs, and milk really come from, what factory farming is, 
and how it affects our communities and the environment. This free event takes place at Fat Beats Farmers Market, 5715 Market Street in Oakland. For details, call 510-851-1742. The community calendar is produced by members of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Send your listing at least three weeks in advance to KPFA, Box 51, 1929, Martin Luther King Jr. Way in Berkeley, California, 94704. Or email us at calendar at kpfa.org. Please tell us if your event is wheelchair accessible. To hear this calendar again, call 510-848-6767, extension 621. This calendar is also online at kpfa.org. You are invited to the Spring Benefit for Los Sensores Mexican Arts Center in San Pablo on Sunday, April 22nd. This afternoon, Tardeada features a silent auction, delicious Mexican food and beverages, and live music by the band Los Sensores. Los Sensores Academy has been a cornerstone in the community for over 20 years, training young artists and providing a safe and inspirational space for students and their families. You can join us in support of nurturing tomorrow's leaders through cultural education. Tickets are $40 and are available for purchase by calling 510-233-8015. That's 510-233-8015. Or check us out online at www.lossensoltlace.com. That's www.lossensoltlace.com. Los Sensoltlace Mexican Arts Center. Amplify your voice. 